Hey everybody, happy Wednesday. Welcome back to another Encore study group. Uh, we've got to jump right in, honestly, because we've got a lot to cover today. We're covering high availability techniques, which is stuff like HSRP, let's pull the agenda up here, HSRP and VRRP and GLBP. And then we're going to dive into a little bit of SSO and NSF, which is stateful switchover and nonstop forwarding. And I think that most of us probably grasp these first operand NC protocols, but maybe less so understanding exactly how SSO and NSF tie into things. Again, keep in mind that when it comes to the Encore content, which is specifically in this blueprint item, high availability techniques, it's not just about first hop redundancy protocols. SSO and NSF are not first hop redundancy protocols. They are simply high availability techniques. And if we look at the Encore blueprint, it specifically calls those out alongside first hop redundancy protocols. So again, we've got a lot to cover, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So high availability techniques, first hop redundancy protocols, this is Encore, meaning that you've likely already either studied CCNA or you're going for your CCNA and are just kind of, you know, testing the waters with Encore. Or maybe you've already got your CCNA, but either way, we're assuming that you've got a CCNA level of knowledge and understanding if indeed you're here studying Encore level content. And so the CCNA level of a first hop redundancy protocol is basically just understanding what exactly we're trying to accomplish. And I'll spend a couple of minutes here just as a quick review, especially just in case anybody is still covering these topics at a CCNA level. The idea is this. We have a client PC on a subnet on a network, and it is trying to get out to devices that are not on its network. Now, this could be an unknown destination, like somewhere out on the internet, or it could just be another subnet. You know, we could have, I love it, just toss out here another subnet. We'll call this like VLAN 20. So maybe we have VLAN 10 is green, VLAN 20 is blue. And in order for these two clients to communicate with one another, we have to get routed. We can't just directly communicate at a layer two level. So, you know, this concept of ARPing, right, is if I have two clients, let me, <laughs> let me switch my color again. If I have two clients on the same VLAN, let's say that this is VLAN 10, again, green VLAN is 10. These two clients can communicate with each other directly. They do not have to go up to the routers. They can communicate logically on this network segment. And the reason for that is because I can ARP directly for this IP address. My IP address is somewhere in the, let's just say 10.1.1.x range. It's a slash 24. And this client PC over here would be on the same subnet. So maybe it's .50 and this is .127, who knows? Slash 24, the whole 256 range, well, 254, right, <laughs> minus two, the full range of addresses are available there, so we just grab two of them, 50 and, and dot 127. So they're able to communicate with each other directly. However, any communication that happens off the subnet needs to go through something we call the default gateway. Now, again, if you're still just kind of diving into networking life, then you might not be fully familiar with this, but the idea is simply that rather than ARPing, Rather than saying, hey, where are you to this IP address I'm trying to communicate with, if I'm trying to communicate now to this guy, so let's say he's on 10.2.2.x, maybe he's a .28 on that subnet, I, my PC knows that this is a network that is not mine, and therefore I can't directly reach it in theory. It's on a different broadcast domain. It might be here in the same building as me. It might be you know, in the same organization, but a different building. It could be out on the internet. It could be around the world. Who knows where this subnet is? It's not my job as the PC to know where that is. It's the router's job. And so I'm going to send it up to the router and that would be my default gateway. So here's the problem as we get into this a little bit more. The default gateway is my upstream router, but as we can see here, I drew this with two routers. And there's a good reason for that. It's because of redundancy. You know, if I, you know, let me just kind of pull back to the original drawing. So if I were to show this drawing and say, okay, well, both of them have an upstream connection to another router and that's going to go off to the internet somewhere. So here's my connectivity. I deploy two routers for redundancy. That's great. But what happens if this is my default gateway and I'm sending my traffic up to my default gateway to get out to the internet and then this device goes down? Well, that's a big problem because I just lost my default gateway. And it's great that I've got, I mean, I, I'm looking at this. I see the path. 
up to the redundant router, I see the path that goes to the, uh, maybe it's a service provider router or, or what have you, internet router, and I see. So I've got this path out to the internet, but I can't use it because I am hard configured for a specific default gateway and my default gateway is down. So if my default gateway is down, what am I supposed to do? So the idea of first type redundancy protocols is to say, you know, instead of configuring one default gateway on one of these devices, I'm going to share a default gateway. So this default gateway is usually something we call a virtual IP address or a VIP. This VIP is shared by both of these routers, but usually only owned by one at a time. So what that means is I'm going to send out to, let's say, dot one as my default gateway. And this router up here on the left happens to be dot one. And well, slight caveat there, it owns the dot one IP address. But here's the thing, when this device goes down, now my backup router can take on this dot one persona. And therefore, as far as my computer is concerned, I, my nothing ever ha happened, nothing ever changed. So because it's a layer two operation, I keep forwarding out my interface and now the layer two network, instead of directing it this way, the layer two network is going to converge and realize that dot one now lives that way. And again, my PC is none the wiser. So I never had to change the IP address on my PC. And ideally this happens very, very quickly. And so maybe I didn't even drop any packets in an ideal scenario. Okay, so that is basically the CCNA level of high availability first hop redundancy protocols that, you know, if you're taking your CCNA and you know these basic things, that might be good enough. I mean, you might need a couple of commands for how to enable these and such, but you know, just from a general, general conceptual perspective, this is what we need to know. And so this is where we are um, going to stop from a CCNA perspective. For better or worse, Encore requires us to know a little bit more details. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start covering a lot of the different protocols that are available to us as part of a first hop redundancy protocol design. So we've got a lot of different options out there. Ultimately, what it comes down to is kind of a tale as old as time. Cisco came out with a version of a protocol. The industry said, oh, that's a great idea. We'll come out with our own version of that protocol. And then, you know, Cisco, in some cases, will defer to that. In other cases, Cisco will be like, oh, you actually had some good ideas as well. So we're going to revamp our protocol, which is what they did in this case. And so, um, you know, Cisco even came out with, you know, a fourth protocol. So we've got four different protocols we have to cover. And, uh, and again, this is why we don't have much time. So <laughs> let's drill into this. Um, the first two options are really the same protocol, but two different versions, two of our four. So this would be the hot standby router protocol or HSRP. And as mentioned, we have two versions. We have version one and we have HSRP version two. So we're going to cover generally speaking what HSRP is and try and flag the differences between version one and version two. HSRP, generally speaking, is configured using these standby commands. So I'm going to get onto a router's layer three interface. And typically that's a sub interface. It could also be a layer three switch virtual interface, SVI. That's pretty common, actually. Um, it could just be a raw physical layer three interface. So just any layer three interface where I have an IP address configured, I'd get on there and issue the standby command. Now I can't just write standby. I've got to get some more information. The first piece of information would be the group ID. I wrote this backwards because I didn't plan to write group, but an ID felt kind of naked on its own. So anyways, so the group ID is um, going to be between, depending on your version, HSRP supports 256 groups. So that means zero through 255. If you don't, by the way, include the group ID, which you don't have to, if you just issue the standby command without specifying the group ID, then it would actually assume that you want group zero. So that would be what happens in that case. So it's zero to 255 for version one. Version two gives us 4,096, and we'll cover why here in a little bit. Um, say, well, wait a second, are we really gonna have 4,000 different instances of HSRP running? And the answer is fortunately no. But every single layer three interface that we're gonna configure HSRP on, on a single router should be in its, it really should be in its own group. Because what this group defines is, for the most part, it represents a subnet. 
Um, these two routers are going to be communicating with one another and they will only successfully communicate with each other if the group ID is correct or uh, the same. The group ID must be in agreement. And so as soon as I enter, you know, group one here, and then I enter maybe on a different subnet, if I were to also enter group one, well, that technically that starts to cause some problems. So we usually are going to apply a different group to each layer three interface that we're participating in. All right. The, the big, um, <laughs> the big, re, uh, what am I trying to say here? All right, so the big concept, I think that's what I was trying to say. The big concept we need to understand here is this concept of who owns the IP address. So we're going to create this virtual IP address that we mentioned, this virtual IP. And that command would be, by the way, the standby, then the group ID, then the word IP, and then the IP address, and that would be our full command. And by the way, that's the only command that we need in order to enable HSRP. It is a little weird that our command is standby and not HSRP. They took the S out of hot standby router protocol and made that the command. If you don't like that, then go buy Nexus switches because they actually use HSRP as their command, which is pretty exciting. We don't have to worry about standby anymore in Nexus switches. But in most iOS platforms, you're going to see standby, which is why we lay it out this way. But you just give it a virtual IP address and it'll start communicating to other devices out there. So that's technically all we need. Although, again, we're going to explore some other options here as well. So I specify this virtual IP address. And the big concept that we need to understand here is there's going to be an election because we need to know who actually owns this IP address. I just configured the same virtual IP address on both sides. You know, maybe it's dot one, dot one on the other side. And I was gonna say they fight over it. They don't really fight over it. They have an election process to see who's the uh, active router. And so this is what Cisco calls again, the active router and the standby router. And these phrases change depending on our protocol. So we just need to make sure we're paying attention. But yes, the active router in HSRP is going to own that IP address, which means that it's going to respond to all of the ARP requests as well. So when I ARP, I send an ARP for my default gateway for dot one, basically saying dot one equals who are you? Give me your MAC address. Well, an ARP is a broadcast. And so from a layer two perspective, this is gonna be one packet that goes up, hits the network, and for the sake of our drawing, it's going to go two different ways. Really, it's going to go to every single interface in the broadcast domain. So this is, again, why we want to reduce our broadcast domains and keep our VLANs small is because there's just a lot of broadcast traffic, and ARPs are one of those. So we're going to ARP for our default gateway. It's going to go everywhere, and the active is going to be responsible for responding to this ARP request. And so I send the ARP request uh, response. ARP response is going to come down. And it's going to specify the virtual MAC address. Why is it a virtual MAC address? Well, because when this device inevitably goes down, which, you know, everything falls and fails at some point. So, you know, it's going to go down at some point. Um, once it goes down, we need the standby router to turn back up. You know, number one, the IP address, yes, but also it has to have the same MAC address. And so we share a virtual IP address and we share a virtual MAC address in a first-hop redundancy environment. So that's, the concept is going to be extremely important. This is where especially it starts to get above CCNA levels because we don't usually talk a whole lot about virtual MAC addresses in the CCNA world. So what is this virtual MAC address that we are uh, responding with? Well, it again, depends on the version. Let me change my colors here. All right, and I get to cheat. I've got it written down, but this is something that I guarantee you're going to want to memorize or at least be able to point out if you're studying for the Encore exam. I'm not saying you're going to get a question on it, but I'm going to say that it is within the realm of possibility that you do. In other words, Cisco does expect that we're going to have this memorized. So, virtual, I'm sorry, the version one MAC address is 0000.0c. That would be an OUI or the first, you know, the organizational unique identifier that Cisco owns. It's actually going to be the same in both of these versions. Um, that's going to be 07 dot and then what is it? AC and then XX. Okay. So these two hexadecimal characters, each hex character is four bits. 
So four bits is 16 values, and two of them together would be 16 times 16. Hey, guess what? That's 256 different virtual MAC addresses that Cisco will use in HSRP version one. Well, 256 should sound a little familiar. Version one, 256 groups. The virtual MAC address is going to be based on the group. So if it's group zero, our MAC address will be AC00 at the end. If our group is 10, it'll be AC0A, because A is hexadecimal for 10. And so that's, and by the way, if you're group 255, it'll be FF. And so you've got the whole range there from zero to 255, that would be 256 addresses total. And the virtual MAC address is going to be based on that group. So when we have our virtual two MAC address, version, version two virtual MAC address. Yeah, anyways. So it'll be 0000.0C09. Oops, I didn't, uh, it is F? Yes, it's F. Wait. Oh, boy, I, I, wrote, I wrote that down wrong. Okay, 0C9F dot F. There we go. Sorry about that. And then XXX. Okay, that looks, that looks better. 0C9F dot F. Okay. Um, <laughs> this should be the virtual MAC address for version two. And these three, now we see we have three different hex characters and 16 times 16 is 256, but times 16 again, 4,096. So we have 4,096 different virtual MAC addresses, which again, should sound familiar. Version two has 4,096 groups. So that's why we have all the different MAC addresses available to us and again, Cisco is, is, it's on the table. It's part, it's within the scope of the blueprint to be able to identify which virtual MAC address is being used by which protocol. So we're also gonna cover the VRRP and the GLBP virtual MAC addresses. So uh, just get ready for that. All right. So these are the two different types of virtual MAC addresses that we could possibly use in an HSRP environment. The key thing to keep in mind here is primarily that the virtual MAC address is what I map my default gateway to. So I'm, I've got my default gateway, it's dot one or what have you. This is what it's respond, it's, it's usually the default gateway. I mean, yes, it can be manually configured, but it's usually part of the DHCP scope. Okay, the DHCP scope does not include the MAC address. We should be comfortable with that by now. It's we're, we've got the IP address, but we don't know where in the network from a layer two perspective that that address is living. And so that's what the ARP request does. And the ARP request is going to give us that virtual MAC address, which we do not want to have change if one of these devices were to go down. All right, hopefully that's clear. If not, and by the way, I didn't do my traditional intro because I wanted to jump in right away, but um, especially, hey, you know, now we're, what, about 15 minutes into this. So um, for those of you who are maybe have just joined us or this is your first time, this is meant to be a very open conversation. So you've got any kind of questions, be sure to chime into the chat, ask those questions. I'm, this is pre-recorded, <laughs> so I'm in the chat right now answering as many questions as come in. If you've got anything, then be sure to jump in and let me know. And by the way, if uh, you're in the middle of your Encore studies and you're studying something else, you've got a quick question about that, then don't hesitate to ask. I mean, we're, we're all just kind of trying to help each other out as we go through our Encore journey together. So if you've got some questions that maybe aren't related to HSRP, et cetera, then by all means, ask them and we'll do our best to answer. Me or somebody else. Um, appreciate everybody else who chimes into the chat as well as always welcome to have other people answering others' questions. Okay, whew. So that's a lot we've covered in 15 minutes, holy cow. So high availability, uh, wait, wait. Okay, lost my train of thought here. All right, so we need to we need to kind of keep covering some other HSRP stuff. So um, I'm gonna leave this on. I'm gonna I'm gonna refresh our board here in a moment. So if you've got anything you want to jot down, then be sure to jot it down. Next, we need to cover this concept of the election. So I'm gonna go ahead and take these down. All right, so we have an election that we have to be concerned with. We need to know which of these routers is going to be active in which is going to be the standby. Now, this election happens on a per group basis. So if I've got lots of different groups, uh, you know, I probably wanna split between my two physical devices, uh, the, which one's the active. So maybe 
if I've got, for example, in my case, let's just say I only have two VLANs, maybe I want the active to be um, uh, this device here. You can only do one thing at once. Uh, <laughs> would be this device right here for VLAN 10, but then on my other device, I think I had these colors backwards on the other drawing, but eh, that's fine. Uh, it'll be active for VLAN 20 on the right device. So how do I make sure that it load balances? How do I control this? And the way I control elections is with this value called priority. Now the priority defaults to 100 and the higher priority wins. So if I want, oh, and by the way, the range um, can be 0 to 255. So it's a 16-bit, 16-bit, uh, 8-bit, uh, sorry. It's an 8-bit identifier. So uh, we have 256 different values for, from a priority perspective. So I can assign this, let's say here, the router on the left, maybe I'll make it uh, 110 for VLAN 10, but I'll make it 90 for VLAN 20. Now, meanwhile, on the router on the right, here, this would be for 10, this would be for 20. Meanwhile, on the router on the right, I'm going to flip that. So I'm going to say you are uh, 90 for VLAN 10, but you're 110 for VLAN 20. This would make it so that this router on the left is the winner of the election for VLAN 10. And that would translate to group 10, by the way. And then group 20 here is active on the right because we assigned it a higher priority value on the router on the right. If the priorities are tied, the tiebreaker is equal to uh, the highest IP address. Assumedly, we don't have du duplicate IP addresses other than you know the virtual IP address that we're sharing. We don't count that. So if I've got <clears throat> dot one on the left and dot two on the right, the router on the right will win. Whoa, not sure what that was. The router on the right will win, and so the um, yeah, so that's our tiebreaker. Now, next point, what color do I want to use? Yeah, do some more blue. These routers are going to be communicating with one another. As you can imagine, we just talked about an election. They're going to be sending messages back and forth. A um, couple of these messages, like for example, they're, they're going to be sending the hello messages to each other. Um, that would include their IP address information, their priority value, and just generally speaking, it's going to be their um, letting the other one know that that they're alive <laughs> because if the primary goes down the secondary needs to be aware of that um we that uh let's see here oh yeah timers so we're by default let's talk about these timers by default we are going to send the hello packet every three seconds and then we have by default this concept of a hold timer the hold timer is 10 seconds that means that if I don't hear a hello in the hold timer, so 10 seconds, if I haven't heard you in 10 seconds, then I'm going to assume you're down. Now, if I'm the primary, if I'm the active, then I'm not going to do anything with that, actually. Um, you're down. I'm going to log it. And it'll you know show up in my show standby commands, but I, there's nothing for me to do. I um, mean, yeah, I'm already the active. But if the, if the standby router detects that the active is down, then it's going to take action. It's going to move into an active state and it'll take over for that virtual IP address and that virtual MAC address. And so that's what that's what our hello timers and hold timers define. Now we can tweak these and it's usually recommended that we do. We can make them a whole lot faster because 10 seconds is a long time for a gateway to go down in, in these situations. So you might make the hello timer every one second and the hold timer every three seconds, let's say. Um, you can actually go into millisecond timers. So you can get sub second back and forth timer, so hellos several times a second, and maybe you wait a second or a half a second to really act on that. But if you're gonna do millisecond timers, this does require version two. <clears throat> Incidentally, by the way, if you're deploying HSRP into an environment, there's really no reason not to go version two. So if you find out that you've your organization has HSRP configured and it's still in version one state, you know, I mean, probably look into upgrading that to version two at some point. No reason to go out and do it right away. But it's just these, some of these concepts are, are really nice from a, you know, just having version two. Oops, there goes my camera. Okay. So, um, yeah, my, my camera, I'm working on 
options for my camera. But yes, it turns off automatically every 30 seconds. That's always exciting. Or 30 minutes. So it'll turn off again before we're done. All right. So um, let's see here. Let me check my notes. What's next? Oh, yes. Okay. Preemption. Some of you are familiar with this concept, I'm sure. What's this concept of preemption? So here's the situation. We just had this router go down. Our router over on the right became active for VLAN 10 to keep VLAN 10 online and functional. That's great. That's exactly what we want. But guess what? Then this router, if I can get my eraser to work, here we go. This router comes back online eventually, ideally. You know, I don't know what brought it down, but it's not going to stay down forever. So our previously active router is now back online. Here's the question. Do we want that router to become the active? Or do we want it to be the standby? Okay. If we have this concept of preemption enabled, um, <clears throat> then it will become the active again. So I'd get on there and I'd issue the command standby with my group ID. Let's say it's 100. Well, I guess it was 10 in this case. Standby 10. And then we'd use the command preempt and hit enter. This command is never needed on the secondary switch because in theory it'll never have well, there's a, there's a caveat to this, of course, but generally speaking, it's really for the primary, the active switch only, because it's the one that needs to, is going to have a better priority and have a chance to take over. Um, but but just keep this in concept in mind. There's no harm in configuring it on the secondary, especially if you are doing um, things like object tracking, which we'll talk about later. But uh, basically, if your priority changes, depending on network conditions is what that means. Um, then it's a little more complicated and you might want to consider configuring preemption on both sides. But the idea is simply the active went down, the active is now back online, it's got a higher priority, but the election has already happened, happened without it, right? <laughs> um, router 2 is now our active and so if we want router 1 to be the active again, we have to configure preemption. All right, so that's that concept. And again, by default, preemption is disabled. So if we don't, if we don't configure preemption, you're going to find that one of your routers is probably the active for all of your devices, all of your subnets at once. Because at some point, this one went down and then it came back up, but it's no longer active for any of them. And then maybe this one went down at some point and then this one's the active for all of them. And so, yeah, if you really want to keep it load balanced, you, you need to configure pre preemption. Okay. Um, Last thing, so these hello messages, these, these conver this conversation that's happening. First of all, from a multicast address perspective, this is going to differ depending on the, um, yeah, let me change my color again. All right, multicast. This is going to differ depending on the, uh, the version as well. So version 1 uses 224.0.0.2. Now, this may look a little bit familiar if you are familiar with multicast addresses. 224.0.0.2 is actually the IP address, the multicast address that represents all multicast routers. So when HSRP came out, Cisco didn't reserve and uh, their own IP address, their own Mac uh, multicast address. They just used the all routers. And so this is going to go, this isn't a big deal, but just be aware of this. HSRP version 1 is going to send its hello messages out onto the network and every single router on that network segment is going to receive it if it's running multicast. It's gonna receive it and have to realize that, uh, you know, it's gonna to have to process it and then realize I, I don't need this and then it'll drop it. And so again, it's not a huge deal because in most production networks, you're not gonna have a plethora of routers on one network domain um, that don't wanna receive this information, but you know, just, just be aware of it. So version two, Cisco came out with their you know, or I shouldn't say they came out with, but they reserved a multicast address. And it is 224.0.0.102. All right, good, I did squeeze it in there. <laughs> and sometimes I write things underneath my, my face, I guess. So .102 would be the multicast address that is reserved for HSRP. And we're also gonna interestingly find out that GLBP uses the same multicast address. Cisco probably assumed you're not running both protocols in your network at once, so, which is, a pretty valid assumption, let's be real. All right, so um, the one thing, oh yeah, and one other thing too. Um, these configurations also can, I'm sorry, these communications 
besides using this multicast address, we can authenticate these messages. And so we can use a password basically to protect ourselves. It's largely protecting ourselves from our own misconfigurations. I mean, sure, somebody could truly plug in. I mean, it's it's not beyond the realm of possibility. You've got a, um, a ne'er-do-well, somebody who sneaks onto your enterprise campus and plugs into a wall that happens to be active, which is bad security practice anyways. Uh, so you plug into a wall jack and you, you plug your own router in or you've got your PC designed to be a router and it tries to go in and preempt the uh, HSRP messages, right? So you'd want to lock your network down um, with authentication. I, I mean, it's it's always recommended you do this. There are two different types of authentication. We have open authentication and MD5. If you have any experience in this field, you already know which one is recommended. <laughs> the MD5 because open is truly an open text. So if you use open, you can just hook up a common ethernet sniffer and sniff out the password that these routers are broadcasting to each other, multicasting to each other. Um, whereas MD5 is, is going to be in, not encrypted, but it's going to be um, hashed. It's going to be a hashed password. So all that to say, um, we do want to authenticate our HSRP communications. We should always do that. It should always be MD5. All right. The last thing I want to say about HSRP, especially when it comes to version one and version two, is I told you I'd answer this question, which is why on earth do we have 4,096 different groups? Why did we? Why did Cisco see the need to change it? And here's the reason why. It comes back to that concept that we did at the start, which is to have two different subnets or many different subnets. So let's say these are layer three switches. And if this is a layer three switch that's running, I don't know, 100 VLANs on it. And in fact, you know what? Let's just say it's running 10 VLANs, it doesn't matter. If I'm running 10 different VLANs and those VLANs are 10 and 20 and 30 and, and it goes, you know, but then it skips, let's say, to 350, 435, uh, 1,058. Whatever our VLAN IDs are, it doesn't matter, but here's the point. When I could create these interfaces, they're going to be an interface VLAN 10, interface VLAN 20, interface VLAN 30. And so when I get onto interface VLAN 10, what group ID would you expect that I'm going to configure VLAN 10 to use? probably VLAN 10 or probably group 10, VLAN 10, group 10 makes sense. So what about VLAN 20? VLAN 20 gets group 20. Makes sense. All right. We're in sync. VLAN 30, VLAN 30 gets group 30. VLAN 350, VLAN 350 gets, I can't go above 255 with version one, can I? So this is why Cisco expanded version Here's two. What I found. Oh, <laughs> maybe that's the noise I heard earlier. All right, Google, thank you for that. All right, um, what was I saying? <laughs> VLAN, okay, yeah. Um, HSRP, we, we can't actually, let's see here, VLAN 350 can't use HSRP group 350 because we max out at 255. So even though we don't need, I mean, we've only got 10 VLANs, we do not need even the 256. The reason Cisco increased it is not to give us more groups. Cisco increased it so that we can match the VLAN ID to the group ID or vice versa, however you want to say that. All right. So with HSRP version two, I can do group 350 on VLAN 350. I can do group 435 on VLAN 435. And I can even do group 1058 on VLAN 1058. Again, all the way up to 4096 or really 4094, which is the max VLAN uh, ID that we can use. So that is why we have 4096 groups in HSRP version two. Just wanted to note that. Okay, so yes, this is what I was afraid of. We're 30 minutes in. <laughs> we have covered our first first type redundancy protocol in HSRP. Fortunately, most of what we just studied is going to apply to VRRP, and we're going to make sure that we explore the differences. Same with GLBP, but we are going to um, still make as good time as we can in order to respect everybody's time. Okay, so... VRRP, the virtual router redundancy, whoops, uh, there we go, protocol. Okay, 
VRRP is again, it's it's your standard story. Cisco comes out with a really cool protocol slash feature. The industry wants it as well on non Cisco devices, so they come up with their own version. It's usually got some shiny things in there that Cisco likes to grab and put into their version as well. But um, you know, VRRP is one of those that you know Cisco didn't just retire their own again. They they went and they just made theirs better. And I'm not exactly sure why that is. You know, there are some things like. ISL versus .1Q trunking, where ISL died as soon as .1Q came out. Um, PAGP and LACP, PAGP is dead. I mean, Cisco had that protocol uh, before LACP came out, and as soon as LACP came out, that, that got deprecated. I don't know why HSRP is still alive when we have VRRP, other than VRRP, <clears throat> well, we'll see here. There are a few things that we still don't get with VRRP that we do get with HSRP. Uh, version two. So um, the biggest thing that we get is this is industry standard. So it is not uh, Cisco owned industry standard. Um, if you're interfacing with a non Cisco device, you have to use VRRP. You cannot use HSRP because HSRP is Cisco only. So if you are deploying this on non Cisco devices, if you are interfacing with a non Cisco device with this, you know, even though you're on a Cisco device, VRRP is uh, for you. Um, blah, blah, blah. Interestingly, because the industry didn't want to copy Cisco directly, we don't use active and standby anymore. Instead, we use master and backup. Those are our role designations in a VRP environment. Um, most of the same concepts apply. We need to figure out which one of these um, is going to be the master. They do an election. There's a priority comparison. That priority, bizarrely, even though it's still an 8-bit number, can only be between 1 and 254. So you may notice that HSRP allowed 0 to 255, and that was great, other than we could use 0 and 255, and VRP doesn't let us do that. Okay. So um, be aware of that. Now, there might be, there, there's sort of a reason for that, for the, for the 0, um, for not using the 0, but we'll actually, let's just talk about it now. So here's an interesting thing that might actually warrant us as Cisco people switching from HSRP because most networks that I've seen that are Cisco networks are still running HSRP. Um, by the way, worth mentioning, um, VRRP, only 256 groups. That's one of the biggest disadvantages to VRRP, honestly, is I can't use, <laughs> you know, again, group ID 350 on VLAN 350. And so that's, that's a bit of a pain. That's a good enough reason for me to go with HSRP uh, version two instead of VRRP. However, again, I already teased it. There is a reason why you might want to consider VRRP, and here it is. VRRP allows us to, uh, what's the word, uh, share? Yeah, I guess. Um, now there's another word I'm looking for. Either way, it allows us to share the physical IP address of the primary router or the master router, okay? So in an HSRP environment, I mentioned if this is like dot one and this is dot two, and I might have a virtual IP address of dot three, I have to use three IP addresses. In an HSRP environment, I have to use three IP addresses. In a VRRP, I can actually assign the virtual IP address to one of those two IPs. So if I assign it to dot one, I, well, either way, I guess regardless of which one I assign it, I'm only using two IP addresses. Now, some of you are already saying, okay, well, wait a second. It's a slash 24, 256 IP addresses. I can save an IP address, whoop-de-doo, right? I mean, what, what's, the, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. What if instead of this being a client subnet, this is an internet service provider subnet? And what if this internet service provider subnet says, okay, this is a slash 29, and this slash 29 gets me eight IP addresses, which, okay, well, wait a second, eight minus two, because we always subtract two, is really six IP addresses, whoops, six IP addresses, and uh, I just used two of them for my router, so now we're down to four. Oh, and the ISP needs one as well, so now we're down to three. So you get three IP addresses. Do you really want to waste one of your three IP addresses on the virtual IP address? So this is this is where you can get a big bang for your buck because I might actually want to keep that IP address in my back pocket in case I want to do some 
static natting down the line, assuming I've got a firewall upstream from there or something like that. So this is um, this is why I might want to consider using VRP instead of HSRP at the internet edge to conserve an IP address. Now, there are some interesting rules to this. The, the, hmm, interesting rules. There's one interesting rule. <laughs> and that's that when I sign the virtual IP address to one of those devices, uh, physical addresses, so like in my case, I have assigned this to dot one, that forces the master to be the primary. In fact, um, I don't know if it's in my notes. Uh, I don't believe it is. My understanding. <laughs> um, this this forces the priority to be zero is is what I believe happens. Um, don't quote me on that, but uh, I'd have to lab that up to confirm. But as I recall in the back of my head, that's that's what that's doing, and that's why I don't get a priority of zero as an option for configuration. But regardless of whether it actually hard configures that as a priority of zero or not, or if it just ignores the priority, either way, what happens is it forces this device to be the master. And the reason for that is because there's no way for the backup, like let's say I, I assigned it dot one, and then this router on the right becomes the master. Well, how does the router on the right manage dot one while dot one is still online? It, it's, it can't happen without duplicating the IP address. And so we don't do it that way. Instead, what happens is the master now has the um, physical IP address, which is the same as the virtual IP address, has a physical MAC address, but it still applies a virtual MAC address to this interface as well. Then what happens is if this device goes down, the backup has its, you know, again, its own physical IP address, no different than HSRP, but it inherits the virtual IP address of dot one at that point, along with the virtual MAC address. So, <clears throat> What is that virtual MAC address? So I'm glad you asked. Virtual MAC address is, uh, again, I get to cheat. I get to use my notes. You won't get to use your notes on the exam. 0000.5e, 00.01xx. Again, as we see here, they only gave us two hex slots for the virtual MAC address. And I, yeah, I don't know why they didn't give us a third, because then we could have 4,096 4, groups at that point. So. Um, as, as far as anything else is concerned, um, what are some of the other things we need to know? Um, here, here are a few differences versus HSRP. Let's just put the differences down here. Uh, preemption concept still applies. Preemption is enabled by default. So now it's the opposite. If you don't want preemption enabled, you have to disable it in VRRP. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, authentication, still an option. Still have open and MD5 options, so always configure authentication. So that's so that's good. Um, the MAC address or the uh, multicast address, by the way, is 224.0.0.18. That's not a great eight. There, that's a better eight. And let's see here. Do, 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 do. I think that might be it. Um, one other point to make, just worth noting, there are actually two versions of VRRP, but unlike HSRP, it's not, it, well, you know, I'll just explain it. Version two is for IP version four. Version three is for IP version six. So there you go. So it's not like HSRP where you could deploy either one, depending on your environment. It's um, depending on which one you want. With VRRP, it depends on whether you're configuring it for IP version four or IP version six. So if it's, IPv4 environment, you have to can enable VRP version two and same with um, IP version six. So being version three. And again, this isn't something like you have to go configure on your router. You don't have to specify which version. It's simply if you're enabling it for IPv4, it's going to leverage VRP version two. Um, whereas with Cisco, you do have to configure which version of HSRP one. Okay, Whew. now what? All right, so running extremely low on time. We're gonna do our best here. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna, well, you know what? Let's just leave it. Next, everybody's favorite protocol to freak out about. <laughs> Global Load Balancing Protocol, GLBP. This is not that bad of a protocol. I have experienced it from the side of freaking out about this because it just seems more complicated. And I've experienced it from the instructor side as well where I see students freaking out about it. I don't exactly know what it is about GLBP that makes all of our hearts 
pound in our chest and we get clammy hands as we're configuring it. Uh, the idea of GLBP, for those who don't know, is this. We can now expand beyond two routers. I don't think I explicitly stated this, but HSRP and VRRP only allow... Tech, uh, you can support many different routers, but you only have one router in the active state and one router in the standby state. Everything else is in an other state um, or a listened state, depending on which protocol you're using. So that's well and good. But even in an HSRP or VRP environment, even though we're supporting two routers, active standby, um, only one of those is forwarding traffic. And so GLBP kind of came out in this age of, well, like we want to be efficient. So what if we have four different routers on our network? and we want all of them to forward. Or for that matter, I mean, I could get rid of these two I just drew and just say, I want both of my routers to forward. Now, in many cases, this isn't required. There's not a strong reason to use HSRP over GLBP other than the complexity. And it is a little more complex. There's a, there are a few more configuration commands, but from a, like a technical side, uh, for whatever reason, we only get 256 groups in GLBP. Cisco just never updated GLBP to get more groups. That's the main thing you lose. All right. Um, otherwise, yeah, it, it forwards in an active active state. So enable GLBP. Let's go for it. <laughs> um, I, yeah, don't take that, by the way. That was mostly a joke. I mean, um, GLBP is more complicated from a troubleshooting perspective. You're having problems in your network. You'd probably rather be troubleshooting HSRP instead of GLBP, but you know that's just again, it's it's just a comfort level. I mean, a lot of people understand HSRP, and not as many people understand GLBP. So here's how GLBP works. It is also a Cisco proprietary protocol, so you can't do this flat out if you're running this on non-Cisco hardware or you're interface, interfacing with a non-Cisco device. All right, um, we have one active virtual gateway. We're going to have an election, same concept, priority, um, and we are going to uh, decide which one of us is going to be the active virtual gateway, AVG. Okay, so AVG, this is a priority-based election, same thing, highest priority wins. Once we have the active virtual gateway, then we're going to find the next best active virtual forwarders. Now the AVG is going to be an active virtual forwarder, AVF, but we're going to find up to three others, AVF, AVF, AVF. It does only support up to four total, including the AVG. So if I had a fifth router on here, it's just not part of that. I don't know in what network we'd have five different upstream routers. You know, this could be used, I guess, at the internet edge, but there's usually more sophisticated techniques at the internet edge. Like maybe you have four different internet service providers. I don't know. If you've ever seen this in production and you've seen a... You, like a, a real solid use case for it, then chime into the chat. Let us all know. Um, I've done a lot of network designs over the years. I've seen a lot of networks. I don't think I've ever seen GLBP in production. <laughs> I don't think I have. So take that as uh, as kind of a... Ah, what's the word? Recommendation? Uh, oh, well, anyway. Word escapes me. So... Um, so here's how this works, okay? The AVG is going to push different virtual MAC addresses out and assign these. So we have different VMACs. So we have VMAC1, VMAC2, VMAC3, and VMAC4. And what's gonna happen is when a client ARPs, sends an ARP response or ARP, sends an ARP request to the network, the active virtual gateway, technically, again, it's a broadcast, right? Everything's going to receive it. The active virtual gateway is going to send the ARP response. The difference is that this ARP response is going to contain the virtual MAC address for, I don't know, one through four, one of these, one of these active virtual forwarders, okay? Um, there are several different ways of load balancing this. You can do it, um, round, well, let's just say here, um, load balancing options. So three different techniques for this. We have round robin. That's truly just, I assign one to you, 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 I come back here, I assign one, I assign one, I assign one, I assign one. And so it just load balances from a client number perspective. So I should have the same number of clients on each one of my active virtual forwarders. Um, the other option, another one of the two, would be weighted. So I can actually configure weights 
on each one of these. So if I configured weights of 100, 200, 200, and 100, then my assignment would be VMAC 1, then 2 of VMAC 2, then 2 of VMAC 3, and then 1 on VMAC 4, and then we'd start over. So we'd be assigning twice as much traffic to the AVFs in the middle because the weight is twice as much. This would be a good use case if you have different upstream circuits. So maybe you've got like 100 meg circuits on, on these two, and then on the edge ones, you've only got like a, a 10 meg circuit or a 50 meg circuit or something like that. So that would be the situation where you'd want to use uh, weighted. Um, the third one we call host dependent. And host dependent is going to, it's, it bases it on the client MAC address. So the client MAC address, it runs it through a hash and it, ba it basically hashes it and decides, okay, based on your MAC address, I'm going to assign you this virtual MAC address. What that means is when I disconnect from the network and then I come back later in the day and I reconnect to the network, I will always be given the same, same gateway. I don't know why that matters. <laughs> it would probably less be with PCs and more like if you've got a uh, downstream router or something along those lines. But um, yeah, I mean, either way, this, this concept would be that it's based on your MAC address and therefore you will always get the exact same active virtual forwarder as your ARP response. All right, a couple of quick things and then we'll move on. So multicast, I already mentioned this. It's going to be 224.0.0.102. It uses the same multicast address as uh, HSRP version 2, so keep that in mind. It also helps it with memorization. It makes it easier. Virtual MAC address. Yes, again, we do have to memorize these. 0007.b, I'll make that capital, b40. Is that right? Yes, b40. And then get this. X, 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 Y, Y. What in the world is going on there? Okay. Um, and I misspoke earlier and I apologize. I got it half right. These are the group ID. Say, so, well, wait a second, Jeff. Uh, you said we don't have, well, anyways, I, what I said was slightly wrong, but um, either way, we don't have 4,096 groups. Um, I don't know why, but what Cisco did was they gave us not xxx would be 12 bits for whatever reason the first two of those bits have to be zero <laughs> so really we only get 10 bits it looks like this zero zero xx and then dot xxxx dot xxxx so we really get 10 bits so that's 2 to the 10 power which is 1024 groups so I misspoke earlier. I said 256. I think um, it's. I was I was wrong with the number, but the point was we don't get 4,096. So what we do is we get 10,024. The YY would be which active forwarder you are. So it's you're you're assigned a, a, a semi-random ID. You're assigned an ID as an active virtual forwarder, and that ID shows up in the MAC address because every active virtual forwarder. Again, we've got the same concept as groups, right? We could have 50 different groups on here. And so within one group, you need a different virtual MAC address because they're all active at once. Unlike an HSRP where only one device has the virtual MAC, all four of these have a virtual MAC at the same time going. Therefore, um, we have to have the active virtual forwarder ID in there. Now, why we couldn't have taken two of those bits and given it back to the group ID because we can only have four of these guys active at once, so we only need, you know, anyways. Um, I, I, I mean, these are questions that we'll never have answers to, but it is what it is. Last quick thing, what are we up to? Oh boy, um, buckle up. We're gonna, we're gonna go fast here at the end. Um, one last thing that's worth noting with GLBP. If one of these devices were to go down, okay? If an active virtual forwarder goes down, this virtual MAC address gets reassigned to another active virtual forwarder. The active virtual gateway is responsible for that. All right. Um, if there's another router available, if there were five routers on this subnet, then that other router would become an AVF. And so you'd still have four routers. But if one of those four goes down and you only have three others, then the virtual MAC address gets assigned to another AVF. In the event that the AVG goes down, 
same concept with H, as with HSRP. Um, the roll would pass to... Oh, there it goes. Told you it was going to come. The roll gets passed to um, another AVF, picks up the role of Active Virtual Gateway. So um, same concept there. So in in reality, GLBP is, is not... I, I'm telling you, it's not complicated. It's just you have to split up in your mind. I mean, it, everything we understand about HSRP and VRP from group IDs and priority and elections and such all apply to the AVG. And if we can just keep those roles separate in our minds, there's the AVG side, winning the election, being a priority, et cetera. And then we think about the load balancing side, that's the AVFs and the virtual MAC addresses being different and the different load balancing options that we have and maybe even configuring weights. I mean, configuring weights is not required. We don't have to do that. So just, just kind of split those concepts up in our minds. And then once we've compartmentalized it a little better, um, it, then uh, we'll, we'll, do, we'll do better, um, I believe, at keeping it all straight. Okay. Whoo. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right. We are truly running out of time. This time I do need to get rid of... Oops, not that. I need to get rid of... Nope, not that either. This. Ha 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 ha. All right. Last concept. So we have this concept called stateful switchover, and oftentimes it's used in conjunction with nonstop forwarding NSF. So you hear the phrase SSO slash NSF used quite a bit. They solve two different problems to but but combine together to solve the greater issue, if that makes sense. Okay, here's what I'm talking about. We have this concept of chassis switches. And in chassis switches, we have this concept of dual supervisors. Many of us are familiar with this concept. It's one logical switch, and but it's modular. And so I can throw 48 port copper port blades in there, you know, like give myself 48 ports of copper, but then I can also throw like 12 ports of fiber in there. And it just allows me to modularly fill out this chassis as however I want. And so the brains of the switch are also modular, modular, modular. Um, we can deploy two different supervisors in there. And of course we want two for redundancy in case one of those supervisors dies. Um, and by the way, we have this exact same concept with some of Cisco's router platforms where you have a router and typically what this is going to look like is you have two what we call route processors. Um, interestingly, by the way, we do have route processors on a layer three switch. They are just embedded inside the supervisor. So either way, we're talking about route processors. But we take for granted that a technology like a chassis switch or a chassis router would just have two brains. And if one of them goes down, the other one comes up really fast, right? I mean, we, we just take it for granted these days. Uh, when when these devices first came out, if one of the supervisors died, like the, all we really did was we stored the configuration on both. And if the second supervisor detected that the first supervisor died, it would automatically boot, do a cold boot, boot all the way up, apply the configuration, bring up all the line cards. I mean, it would be like a 10 minute process basically, or maybe five minutes, I don't know. It just, it would take a lengthy amount of time. And so Cisco came up with this concept of SSO, stateful switchover. A stateful switchover allows me to very quickly transition over to a different route processor, very, very quickly. So we're talking about like less than three seconds. Like, you know, it detects it's down, but, but here's the thing, like even though it detects it's down really fast, like it could detect it's down in the millisecond range, it still has to, like it can be in an almost there state, but it's still got to get like OSPF running and EIGRP and HSRP that we just talked about and all these protocols have to activate and it has to take over all of these things. And so what SSO doesn't help us with is the idea that I might have another router out on the network and these two are talking OSPF to each other. Or like I said, HSRP or, um, or EIGRP or what have you. And so when the supervisor goes down, if you have the right type of chassis, meaning a distributed chassis, so like a Nexus chassis or uh, the 6800s with the line cards, et cetera, like a 4500 chassis is not distributed. 
if you have a distributed chassis, these ports, or these, I should say like this, these line cards have their own forwarding table. They have the forwarding information base built in there. And essentially, it's the routing table. They can forward traffic even though the supervisor is down. That's what a distributed model is. A centralized model says I forward everything to the supervisor because it's the brains of the switch, and they tells me what to do with it. You know, like I, I, I dumb. I don't know what to do with it, so I, I just listen to the supervisor. That's that's what the sup that's what a centralized line card has to do. I did because it doesn't have a fib. No, the fib is stored on the supervisor. So, the uh, the route processor. I'm sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Where, where are we here? Okay. So NSF, okay, let me say why we need NSF. Okay, here's what super, here's what Safeful Switchover doesn't do for us. Safeful Switchover gets us back online very, very quickly, but it still makes it so that OSPF, for example, is down for, 30, for three seconds. In some cases, that means this router is going to drop that neighborship. So the data plane is online. That's good. I can forward traffic. If you send me a packet, I can receive that in an interface. I can look up my fib, where it's supposed to go, and I can whoosh, send it off. Okay, my data plane is up. Is my control plane up? Because my supervisor just died. Who sends the hellos? Who tracks the neighbors? The supervisor. Even in a distributed architecture, the supervisor is still the brains. And who's, by the way, populating this forwarding information base? The supervisor. Is my control plane up? No, my control plane is down. So what are we trying to accomplish here? What we're trying to accomplish is we do not want this part to happen. We do not want the router to drop that OSPF connection because I want this router to keep sending me packets. I can forward packets. I just can't respond to OSPF hello messages right now. I can't send OSPF hellos. I can't send EIGRP hellos. I can't send HSRP hellos, but I can forward all that traffic if you just send it to me. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to maintain my neighborships. This is what nonstop forwarding is meant to address. Nonstop forwarding solves this problem and allows me to have grace on responding to hello messages, okay? So um, what, what happens here is when I, when I configure NSF on an OSPF process, when these two devices become neighbors, they send their hellos to each other and they become neighbors, this part, this NSF concept is exchanged. This router knows that that device is NSF capable, which means that if I stop receiving hellos from that side, I'm going to show it a little bit of grace. Not too long. Because if it legit went down, then I need to redirect my routes. And certainly I do need to have the conversation in-house as to whether I want this functionality. But the idea here is, is not to give it an extra three minutes of grace. It's saying I am leveraging SSO to make sure that I am back up and running within three seconds. So I now need NSF to maintain the control plane information or hold it, pause it basically, say don't drop me as a neighbor send me that traffic and allow my data plane to do its thing. Okay. Um, I hope that made sense. Let me just check my notes here real quick. Um, da -da 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 okay. Still checking my notes. Okay. Yeah. The only other thing would be um, both sides need to have NSF enabled. We can't just, like, if, if this side doesn't have NSF enabled, it's gonna ignore the, the fact that the left side is has it enabled. Um, also, when the peer goes down, when, when it does detect, because it's still gonna detect that that device is down, it's just not gonna drop the neighborship, but it will mark all of its routes as stale. Yeah, because it needs to know which routes it learned from that neighbor so that it basically can react once it's either down or whether it comes back online. Um, once it comes back up, it's going to send a graceful restart message to say, hey, I'm, I'm uh, here, graceful restart. It's going to send that message to the router and say, hey, I'm back online, what I miss? And so it's going to fill, basically it's going to update, the routers are going to update each other because I just fired, I just fired my secondary supervisor up. I need to populate this fib again. And so I need all of that information. And so I'm going to, 
bring it all in, make sure I didn't miss anything. It's been a few seconds. This works great as long as nothing changes in the network. You know, I mean, if, if for whatever reason, another router somewhere went down during this three second process or however long it takes, doesn't matter. I keep saying that, but if a change happens in the network, this fib doesn't get updated because I have no ability to update it. My control plane is down. My data plane is assuming nothing has changed. Again, all of this would be completely a bad idea and completely pointless if we don't have SSO configured. If we have SSO configured, then we should be back up and running really, really quickly. And so it's just there to absorb the hiccup. We expect, again, we expect if a supervisor dies or a route processor dies, that we'll be back up online very, very quick. Or, okay, I shouldn't even say that. If a supervisor dies, we expect there to be no, no hiccup whatsoever. We want traffic to keep flowing. It's why I invested in the, you know, the decentralized or the distributed model uh, of chassis. You know, I want this to keep going. If one of my supervisors dies, why should my switch experience a hiccup? That's what this technology is meant to give us. So, all that said, um, that was a lot. That was a lot in an hour. We 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 barely almost almost made it. <laughs> very very close. But uh, so thank you for sticking around for a few extra minutes. Um, SSO and NSF is something that is glossed over a lot. I hope that helped uh, make a little bit of sense because I, I mean even even a lot of uh, like official cert guides don't exactly do it justice with the amount of time and effort. And of course, I just gave it five minutes. I'm talking about doing it justice, but splitting those concepts up and understanding what they do. I mean, yes, they go very well together. Um, peanut butter and jelly go very well together, but they're both there for different reasons and they solve different purposes. Um, I'm not sure what the purpose of, you know, peanut butter gives you a little bit of salty and jelly gives you a little bit of sweet and you combine them and that's even better together. I don't know. This analogy's getting, going downhill fast. So thank you very much for everybody, uh, to everybody for joining us. I'm going to keep this video rolling for another five minutes, just in case there's other questions in the chat that prevent the YouTube live from rolling over to whatever's next for you. Um, so hit me up with any questions that you might have and I'll be doing my best to answer those. Um, next week we are going to be covering, uh, oh, cloud versus on-prem deployments. So if you've heard of the cloud and you're trying to figure out what that means from a networking perspective, be sure to come in two weeks. We are going to be covering exactly that, what exactly cloud means, why it matters. And the cool thing about this too, is we're going to be covering a little bit about data centers. Um, data center technology is a big passion of mine. I love data center technology. I spent a lot of time with data center technology and I, my experience is both my experience and the experience I've seen of others is that if you don't, if you don't live and breathe the data center, you don't really know what's going on in there. Um, and if you find yourself in that situation, you're a network engineer, you spend your time focused on the network or whatever the situation is there, um, then come and hang out because you're going to learn a lot about what exactly is going on in the data center, why it's so important. And yes, what that means versus what a cloud deployment means. So that's in two weeks. That would be on August 12th. In the meantime, I hope everybody has a great couple of weeks and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.